What do aliens, esports, 3D modeling, and fire-resistant wood all have in common? That's right, it's it's Hytale. The team behind this long-awaited game are now deep into playtesting, hard at work perfecting the new engine for our sweet eyes to behold, and despite the last update not giving us any gameplay as many were expecting, we did still get a whole host of new information to unpack regarding the story of Hytale, including a large animated art piece with some extra secrets we'll analyze later. Additionally, what we did get from Hypixel Studios in December was an honest breakdown of where the project is at and what we can expect in the following months. The engine redevelopment is on track, the team are being fully onboarded, and they are opening up to more and more questions. They've been transparent with us, let's be honest. They've directly communicated their intentions going forward, something that this community and many of you watching always insist on from game developers. After the team do finally reveal that engine, they can reintroduce regular blog posts as they showcase aspects of the game that more closely fit their vision and show off gameplay that actually represents the final product, as at that point, they will no doubt be heading towards heavy marketing territory. We've spoken a few times on this channel about how due to the dwindling hype surrounding the game since the overwhelming 60 million view trailer five years ago, the next time the team draws attention to Hytale, it really needs to be the time. The project's reputation probably wouldn't withstand any more significant delays or false starts. The next time Hypixel Studios puts their foot on the pedal, it really is go time. Hence why they haven't been reigniting the hype before now. Why they haven't continuously pushed out videos on the legacy engine for the last two years despite knowing that it would be outdated content. And hence why their investor, Riot Games, haven't been pushing the project or screaming about it from the rooftops to the rest of the gaming industry yet. They only have one shot at this, and they're aiming very, very carefully with lots of caution so that they don't get people too excited too early. The team have even shared advice on how they plan to avoid development hell, steering clear of the death march by producing a game in a very authentic way. They have a properly structured team with professional processes and have adapted year on year as they continue to scale towards their central vision. The whole team shares this clear vision, which is the company's strategy to avoid feature creep. They're not laying anything else into what they see now as the game. They also hold their players and community in very high regard. It's essential to them that we have a voice that helps keep them in check and so that they can listen for signals and study data. They ensure lots of time is spent on the developer workflow itself and have lots of quality testing, meaning money isn't just being wasted. They've built proper pipelines and certification processes for the game's release, and they don't want to neglect that vital period after years of work. The whole post from John about this is pretty insightful, and with people like this at the helm of the project, it makes it a lot easier to forgive the lack of gameplay in recent years. What some of you may have forgotten though, is that the team are active on social media and we get answers about features and the lore of the game all the time. In regards to villains and bosses, there's been plenty of talk from the devs, for example, the topic of refighting bosses once you've beaten them. The answer is apparently complicated, but generally, yes. In fact, they went as far as to say that you can actually befriend some hostile mobs provided you put in enough effort, maybe requiring a rare item or special task to be performed. Regarding enemy mobs, the first way the game director actually died in Hytale was via a golem guarding a portal. After that was a pack of Skarix, which is the insect faction that live in the deserts, and the most recent was a bear cranked to apparently mega boss power levels. So imagine something like this, but just a lot angrier or grislier. Going back up the hierarchy, the team stated that they have actually added more villains to the story itself, and that they are far more powerful than before. Of course, right now we only really know of Varen, and there were probably more in the story way back then that we didn't know about. Varen, though, is the big evil mystery antagonist of the story, who seemingly stands in direct opposition to the player. He wields a purple void magic that has been hinted to do pretty gnarly things to whatever it infects, likely because it is not from this planet. No, 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 for many years now, we've theorized that Varin is not of this world. This world being Orbis, the place where the adventure mode is set. And world meaning Altiverse, which is what the collection of planets are called in the Hytale universe. We can actually draw direct ties to Varin and the Altiverse of Nexus, that being the color of purple, and Nexus conveniently being located right next to Orbis on this pretty ancient concept art released in 2019. John did confirm that this planet is still a part of the story, and recently claimed that both Varen and the inhabitants of Nexus are very interesting. Well, he technically said crafty, but honestly that could mean anything. Like, are they mischievous and cunning? Do they make plans? Are they, like, actually good at crafting? One theory that has been shared around a lot is that Varen could actually be another avatar, much like the player and much like Gaia, another pivotal character in the story. She's the one that created Orbis. Whilst Gaia may control or used to control the inhabitants of 
of Orbis, Varen does much the same with whatever creatures and evil monsters he created on Nexus, like two players going to war. John did say that Varen could change his legs into tentacles if he wanted, so that means the dude has got some insane levels of power, and we know avatars can change and customize their form, which makes the theory even more convincing. In relation to 3D modeling and being able to create your own mobs and villains and blocks as an avatar yourself, we still don't know too much about the custom model maker that comes with the game. A lot of people have asked how they would be able to get ahead and practice the Hytale style before the game actually comes out. And whilst John said it was too early to discuss tools and workflows, you really can't go wrong with developing skills in places like Blockbench, which the team likely took lots of inspiration from. As Hytale is owned by Riot Games, someone asked if Poros will be in the game. Whilst not in adventure mode, John said he can certainly try to get them in the overall game itself. Perhaps they'll be in an online component or a mini game of sorts. Speaking of online and mini games, esports became a topic of conversation recently. Clearly character controls are a lot more versatile and varied in Hytale, so people were curious whether it would have some kind of esport eventually. John correctly said, in my opinion, that this will be up to the players, as esports generally chooses you. AKA, there's no point trying to design their game with the sole focus of making it an esport when the players tend to dictate what is and isn't regardless nowadays. At least when it comes to less typical genres. And speedrunning can be done in all games anyway, so definitely expect some Hytale any percents. I'm just curious what a Hytale speedrun would even look like. Assuming the story or overall progression is fairly beefy, will we be talking about minute or hour long records? And I wonder what items would be crafted for the first speedrun meta. John said that each faction has their own unique quirks and mechanics that we can interact with. Quebecs are an easy go-to because of their special wood that grows into shapes when they sing at it. Trorks have tricks that they can utilize in their hunting, and Ferens have been through a lot of hardships so have plenty up their sleeve. The dark human faction, the Outlanders, may have a twist on actual crafting, which could aid speedruns or potentially hinder them. Outlanders are connected to dark, deathly mutating magic after all, but Skarrix definitely take the cake for John as the craftiest. I really do wonder what is within those deep dark insect tunnels. Any of these factions could be the best way to get a leg up in early speedruns, all of them having gone through a huge overhaul these last few years. The faction like the Skarrix going from kill on sight creatures to apparently fundamentally intriguing as a species. You want to explore and get to know a lot more about them now, and there is a lot more to know. Even the Ferens, who were initially presented as a faction that were captured by the Skarrix, who have now broken free, they have come incredibly far and developed a whole new history since doing so, which we've seen nothing about at all. Now, we all know the community meme about burning Quebex, and there's been jokes from the team members about making Quebex fire resistant, but John all but confirmed that the tree-based faction have probably considered this idea. If you were a powerful tree race, you would probably devote some time to defending against fire attacks, so good luck to all you meddlesome players out there. Fire also wouldn't be how players collect that magical sun wood that we mentioned earlier that can be grown through Quebex singing. But John did say that there was a clue in the art video they released in December, so I wanted to dig through the entire 4K image to find all the easter eggs I could find, prepare for a full list. We have a new long beaked bird and a pigeon in the bush. Ironically, this seedling is feeding seeds to a number of different bird species. There's a hidey hole covered by leaves, which may be a generated structure we can find or come across as we explore. The trees bend to create roofs and shelters, likely due to being this magical sun wood created by tree singers. There's a Quebec drinking a cup of something out of the window, maybe water or tea, a seedling sleeping by the door with a sun carved on it, a reference to how Quebec's photosynthesize, a sleeping pod or cradle of some kind, then up here by the sleeping Quebec, this could be an owl or rooster or something. Then we get a Quebec carrying a beehive, which is quite a curious concept. I wonder what they're planning to do with them. Maybe they harvest and consume honey. Notice this Quebec has a number of piercings too, which is an awesome feature in my opinion. I hope it shows up in game as it shows a lot of character. A newly introduced tree singer walks along with a basket full of fruit, and some seedlings sit around a sleeping elder, which is decorated with a number of charms, dream catchers, and totems of all kinds. All this whilst a Quebec plays a mysterious woodwind instrument over here, potentially for entertainment or maybe to help the surrounding area grow and thrive. A partially confirmed theory is that Quebecs use singing to enrich themselves with magic, not just the wood around them. I wonder if their music possesses any other magical properties. Maybe this instrument could be used to cast a protective barrier around the village, or a Quebec could act like a bard in your party. Over here there's a dagger pigeon hiding in the leaves above, and that does make me question if we'll see bird nests 
nests appear in some trees, as we've seen so many types of birds so far in the game. A Quebec runs through an outcrop holding a block or box. It's kind of like a drum, but it also has a rectangular tag. It could be trade goods, which will become important later, so remember that. Over in the water is an ornate carved boat. Another thing I love is all these crafted items have stalks and spherical berries. Perhaps this is a signature aspect of Sungwood. It's also cool to imagine Quebecs using boats to go fishing or cross the rivers, for example. Further up the river, we have something lurking in the water, possibly a frog or a beast frog that we've seen before, and a swan or weird duck thing with big ears below the waterfall. This waterfall also reminding us that yes, water will spawn on varying levels of terrain across the world, similar to Minecraft's recent updates, adding even more depth to your exploration. Up in the trees, we see a Quebec holding a plant pot with a tree singer mentoring him. He's holding up a bushel of some kind. Maybe it's actually in the process of making some wood. Then for the best bit in my opinion, we find two more decorated elder trees sleeping. I have to just say I love the ears. Quebecs are all about singing, sound, music, sharing stories, and ears are a big part of hearing and taking in all of that. Like the stories of the forest echoing around them, and they can hear every bit of it. We then get an exciting glance at a human character, most likely representing a player who appears to be bartering or browsing items at this Quebec's hut. Is it a market stall of some kind? Will this be where we trade with the Quebecs? This may actually be how we acquire the Sungwood, as John mentioned there was a hint in this image. After all, when asked if the factions and races of Hytale know whether the player character is an all-powerful avatar or not, John answered that there is a reason why Quebecs feel such a sense of comfort and familiarity with players when they are encountered, which further suggests that you can probably trade with them and develop a great relationship to gain some goods. One thing they won't be able to trade you is a multifunctional, adjustable ergonomic chair to help you perfectly optimize and customize the way you sit at home or in the office. Because to get something like that, you'd need to check out this video's sponsor, FlexiSpot. FlexiSpot offers a number of home office products and is the go-to place for standing desks and chairs, one of which I recently got to use myself. The BS12 Pro model has three visible buttons that easily let you adjust the height, recline and tilt to lock the back at a certain angle, and adjust the seat depth. This is a massive improvement from my last chair. This chair comes with a dynamic back support, an adjustable armrest and a headrest, plus it holds up to 250 kilograms, so you can fully customize your seating for any situation you're in. Some chairs can end up getting quite rough over time, but FlexiSpot's Wintex mesh is breathable and can withstand up to 10 years. Honestly, the chairs fit right into my workflow in the few weeks I've been testing it, especially when combined with the E7 standing desk that FlexiSpot sent to me earlier this year, which you can also adjust the height of using its LED screen, which has four presets. It's the most popular standing desk FlexiSpot offers and it fits all needs, can be used for years, is stable, steady, sturdy, and comes with a 7 year warranty. So sink your teeth into all of their juicy offers by using the QR code on screen or visiting the link in the description to get your own. Random fact, Quebecs have teeth which means they must eat more than just sunlight through photosynthesis. What is that they eat? I don't know. Is that plants? Would that be cannibalism? So maybe they actually eat flesh? Are the trading huts actually a ploy to murder you? Who knows? Stay safe and keep free.